When the decision was taken to close the Jersey Railways and Tramways line to La Corbière in 1936, following the disastrous fire which had destroyed most of the company's rolling stock, stabled for the winter in St. Oban's station, it was naturally assumed that Jersey had seen the last of railways. The Jersey Eastern Railway, which once ran to Goree, and the Jersey Railways and Tramways, which connected St. Helier to La Corbière, were primarily passenger-carrying lines, and their demise had been hastened by a comprehensive network of motorbus routes, which gradually covered most of the island, and, by 1937, vehicles of the Jersey Motor Transport Company operated to the west, and those of the safety coach service to the east, whilst the parishes of St. Martin and St. John were served respectively by Mr. Slade's blue and white bus service and Mr. Pitcher's Tantivy buses. Fleets of Chazabon carried loads of happy holidaymakers on their mini and varied excursions around the island. During the 1930s, Jersey became well known as a holiday resort, particularly after the opening of the airport at St. Peter in 1937. But during this period, war crowds were gathering, and in September 1939, Britain declared war on Germany following the latter's attack on Poland. Despite this, in the spring of 1940, Jersey was being advertised as the ideal place for a wartime holiday. But anyone who entertained any such plans for relaxation had them rudely shattered in May of that year, when the German army swept westward in its swift advance through the Low Countries and on into France. Soon the Channel coast was reached, and on July the 1st, the armed forces of the Third Reich occupied Jersey, and German troops were parading through the streets of St. Helier. In the early days of the occupation, it was not considered necessary to build extensive fortifications as the Germans believed that the war would be over in several weeks and consequently only a few light anti-aircraft guns were set up to guard the harbours and airport and barbed wire barricades were installed around the coast. But early in 1941, Hitler was contemplating his attack on Russia and ordered that the defences of the Channel Islands be greatly strengthened to repulse any surprise attack by the British. As a first step, troops of an army construction battalion began work on the consolidation of a number of coastal strongpoints, and these were frequently the old forts and towers built in the 18th and 19th centuries. These works, however, were only a prelude to what was to follow after October the 20th, 1941, when Hitler issued his impregnable fortress order, and shortly afterwards, the Todd organization was ordered to work on the islands. The OT, as the organization was commonly known, was a vast semi-military force, at the head of which was Dr. Fritz Tudd, a civil engineer of great experience and competence, shown here wearing the uniform of the German Air Force, in which he held the honorary rank of general, inspecting a proposed gun position above St. Helier Harbor during a visit to Jersey in November 1941. Shortly afterwards, German civilian contracting firms, together with enormous quantities of material, began to pour into the island on an unprecedented scale, and work on the construction of Fortress Jersey commenced. The outcome of all this activity, which went on unabated for over two years, was the array of anti-tank walls, bunkers and tunnels, which survive to the present day. In the course of their construction, all these fortifications consumed millions of cubic meters of concrete. An observation tower such as this is said to have devoured no less than 5,000 bags of cement alone. Add to this the crushed stone and sand used as aggregate, and it soon becomes clear that the OT had a transport problem of some magnitude on their hands, and it is not surprising that those in charge took the decision to lay a meter gauge railway, which, in its final form, reached many parts of Jersey which had never before seen a railway. In January 1942, a narrow gauge system was laid out on Grooville Common to transport sand from the adjacent beach to a loading point at Gordy Village, where the trains transferred their loads to lorries for onward conveyance to building sites all over the island. 
This system was later extended to Les Mortiers Quarry, where a large stone crushing plant was erected and laid on the surface of the roadway to Gory Pier in order that sand and crushed stone could be loaded onto barges and conveyed by sea to St. Helier and to St. Ogham. It was also in connection with the conveyance of crushed stone that the much larger meter gauge railway track was laid to the west of the island. To supply this stone, defunct quarries were reopened while existing quarries were extended and as far as possible, they were all connected to the OT railway. Work on surveying the route of the line commenced early in 1942 and by April of the same year, gangs of OT labourers could be seen laying the track from St. Helier Harbour in the direction of Millbrook and St. Ogham. The official opening ceremony took place on July the 15th and was performed by Colonel Graf von Schmethoff, military commander of Jersey, from a decorated platform erected outside the abattoir. Having made a speech in which he thanked those responsible for pushing the work ahead, the colonel declared the railway open and the locomotive, a French 060, painted khaki and bedecked with greenery and flags, sounded its whistle and moved forward to break a decorated tape. Following this, the German national anthem was played by the attendant Luftwaffe band and the official party, in common with those who had opened earlier railways in Jersey, retired for a commemorative luncheon, held in this case at the Pondor Hotel. As completed, the meter gauge line ran the entire length of the Albert Pier and on both sides of the North Quay, with a reversing spur in front of commercial buildings. Leaving the vicinity of the harbours, the line gained the route of the former Jersey Railways and Tramways line opposite Castle Street and followed this to St. Oban. But there was a branch at this point near Millbrook, which led into what was once known as the Circus Field, but under the OT was renamed Lager Streubel, after the German firm which maintained a large wood store on the site. Between Belle Royal and Beaumont, a second and larger branch cut across the main road and ran alongside Le Percage the old sanctuary path, to Goose Green Marsh, where three long sidings supplied a coal dump. In 1943, the line was extended northwards towards Tesson Mill to supply coal for the steam-driven generators of the electricity power station erected by the OT at this point. The building serves today as the main repair workshops of Bell Royal Motors. Situated at St. Oban, on the site of the former terminus of the erstwhile Jersey Railway, were the engine sheds and main repair workshops of the OT Railway. All repairs, even those of the heaviest nature, were undertaken here. There were several sidings, a coal depot and a water tower supplied from the public pump on mont -Levaux. On leaving St. Oban, the line encountered the same stiff gradients which had often taxed the powers of the earlier locomotives on the climb to Lamoy. Immediately beyond St. Oven was the tunnel, bored in 1898 and seen here as it was in 1936. When the Jersey Railways and Tramways ceased operations, the tunnel was left untouched until early 1942, when the OT moved in and greatly enlarged the internal diameter and added new galleries to form an underground store for ammunition. To protect the lower entrance, a blast wall was added so that the trains of the OT railway had to follow the same sinuous path around the foot of the hill as used by the trains of the Jersey Railways Company before the tunnel was completed in 1898. However, rail access to the tunnel was not overlooked and a shunting spur led back to the upper entrance. Inside the tunnel, now used as a store by the Public Works Department, the meter gauge track is still embedded in the concrete. Leaving the vicinity of the tunnel, the line climbed past Seven Oaks and onto Pont Marquet. Following the closure of the Jersey Railways and Tramways in 1936, the track bed of the railway was laid out as a public walk and garden. And it is amusing to recall that this work was still in progress in 1942 
and had barely been completed at La Corbière when the OT arrived and put the railway back again. At Pont Marquet, the line divided. That leading to the right proceeded to St. Peter and St. John, while that leading to the left followed the old route to La Corbière by way of Donbridge and Lamoy, where the remains of this concrete platform mark the site of a huge cement store erected near the present-day Modelaine estate. Journey's end was reached at La Corbière station, a distance of some seven miles from St. Helier. The ruling gradient was one in 40 between St. Oban and Donbridge, and as in the days of yore, when trains heavily laden with racegoers struggled up the incline to Don Bridge, it was customary for loaded trains of the OT railway to receive banking assistance by the attachment of a second engine at the rear. In pre-war years, and indeed as it is today, the most productive quarry in Jersey was that at Roney, situated roughly midway along the north coast of the island. The OT lost no time in bringing this valuable source of stone into their sphere of operations under the aegis of the Westdeutsche Steinwerk Company and connecting it by rail to St. Oban and St. Helia. Concurrently with the laying of the meter gauge line along St. Oban's Bay, work started on the laying of a similarly gauged track through the parishes of St. John, St. Mary and St. Peter. Leaving Ronay Quarry, this line struck due south to Le Cutley where it swung westward, parallel to the main road from St. John to St. Mary. Notice how, in this view taken in 1945, the telephone poles have been set back to allow passage for the railway and where they still remain over 40 years later. Indeed, all along the route from St. John to St. Peter and beyond, the marks left by the OT railway can be seen indelibly stamped on the countryside if one knows where to look. Hedges, which have replaced demolished granite walls and these unrepaired gaps near St. Mary's Church all tell their story. At Les Augeres, on the site of the houses on the left, a large rail-road interchange point was established. Indeed, the houses came to be built as the result of the large quantities of sand and stone deposited here rendering the ground unsuitable for further agriculture. The area is sometimes referred to as the junction, for not only did a branch swing away in the direction of St. Juan's Bay, but a further branch was intended to come in from the direction of Les Landes in the parish of St. Juan. Leaving Les Augeres, the line proceeded through the gap in the hedge in the middle distance, and through another gap in the nicely repaired wall in the foreground. It was here that the branch for St. Juan's Bay swung off to the southwest. The line then skirted the main road and on past the gate of La Hague Manor before reaching the top of Beaumont Hill near the property known as Nompere. The route of the line for the next mile is now buried beneath the several extensions to the main airport runway, but it then passed through the grounds of what is now the Mermaid Hotel and dropped down through Le Sauf Value to Pont du Val, where a passing loop was to be found, one of the few on the system. The line then passed through a little known and secluded corner of St. Brillard, close to the property known as Beauvalon, eventually joining the St. Oban to La Corbière line at Pont Marquet. It is interesting to note that in making the connection at this point, the Organisation Tote, after a lapse of almost 60 years, fulfilled the ambitions of the 19th century railway promoters with their abortive plans for a Jersey Northwestern Railway. It will now be convenient to deal with the uncompleted line to Les Landes. This was intended to convey the building materials for the construction of the artillery battery at this point. But in the event, the work on the battery site was completed before the railway and the project was abandoned, but not before some two miles of track had been laid. This began at Les Landes and crossed La Route des Landes at the spot marked by the broken wall and then struck due east to pass just to the south of the OT camp known as Lager Murders, which stood in the field now occupied by St. George's estate and on through Letoquet to cross the main St. Juan's Road at Leoville where the grass growing through the gaps left between the loosely replaced granite stones marks the exact crossing place. The line petered out 
just beyond La Chasse, near the state's telecommunications center, rather less than a mile from the intended junction at Les Augeres. It was in this field at Les Toquets that most of the rails and sleepers used on the Les Londes line were assembled. When construction ceased, this material was left lying around for some considerable time so that local inhabitants began to help themselves to sleepers to augment their supply of firewood. This practice passed unnoticed for a while until one farmer arrived with a horse and cart and removed the lot. Subsequent investigations by the field police not only recovered most of the sleepers, but also uncovered a few other illicit activities. Several escaped Russian slave workers were rounded up and some local people spent some weeks in jail. The railway down through the Val de la Mar, as already stated, left the main line just south of Les Augeres and swung in a southwesterly direction to cross this meadow, where the track bed may still be discerned, before reaching the main St. Juan's road near La Hougue farm. How many people realize that they are passing over a former railway bridge at this point? The construction of the Val de Lamar line was by far the most difficult, as many tons of rock had to be blasted to make way for the track, the root of which now lies buried beneath the waters of the Val de Lamar reservoir. To cross the by road close to Bethesda Chapel, it was necessary to erect the concrete bridge, which stands there today, and from this bridge the track led on to a substantial embankment that was thrown up with the sand removed during the excavation of the three anti-tank ditches, one of which survives to the south of St. Juan's Pond. Work on the Val de la Mar line commenced in July 1942, and the track was of mixed 60 centimeter and meter gauge as far as the property known as Red Roofs, where the engine sheds were situated. Beyond Red Roofs, the line was exclusively of 60 centimeter gauge. On reaching the five mile road, this 60 centimeter gauge line swung both north and south by means of a triangular junction. That proceeding northwards ran parallel to and on the landward side of the five mile road to reach the quarries of Latak and La Tibo. Little remains here to remind us of the intense activity that went on hereabouts since the remains of the stone crusher were demolished in 1972 so that it is extremely fortunate that some contemporary photographs have survived. The first of these shows the stone crusher hard at work. Note the little diesel engine on the bridge which spanned the road and led to the quarry face. A similar bridge running to La Tibo stands behind the building. The second photograph shows the network of lines at the quarry face. The working party consists mainly of Russians, but the driver of the diesel engine standing on the extreme left is the late Francisco Font, a Spanish Republican who remained in Jersey after the war. This was the extent of the railway to the west of the island, but the promised intention of projecting the meter gauge line to the east could not be fulfilled due to the many topographical difficulties encountered, and in its place a 60 centimeter gauge line was constructed. Leaving St. Helier Harbour, this narrow gauge line ran in front of commercial buildings, where it soon encountered a major barrier in the shape of the English harbour, which had to be crossed by means of a substantial wooden trestle bridge, which incorporated a central lifting span to allow fishing boats to pass beneath. A tunnel, bored beneath Mount Bingham, took the line through the old harbour works yard and onto the walks at La Collet towards Havre des Pas. The line then ran along the roadway through the front garden of the Normandy Hotel and a green road joined the route of the old Jersey Eastern Railway which it more or less followed through St. Clement to eventually make an end-on junction with the existing 60 centimeter network which had existed on Grooville Golf Course since early 1942. Few relics of the OT railway to the east remain, but anyone interested should visit Les Mortiers Quarry, 
where the former crushing plant building was converted into a block of flats in the 1950s and further extended some 10 years later. It takes a practiced eye to realize that something is not quite normal about the building, but a glance at the rear will reveal the cantilevers which once supported the crushing machinery and may be compared with those on the identical building at Letac, which was demolished in 1972. What of the motive power and rolling stock of the OT railway? The latter took the shape of some 200 side-tipping wagons, which are often said to have come from Poland. This is hardly surprising, as they all bore the legend Paul Gorgas, Posen, on their flanks. But in actual fact, like many of the locos, they came from the fleet of Paul Fro, a French public works contractor from whom they were summarily commandeered by the Germans presented to Gorgas, who was working for the Germans, and who lost no time in replacing Fro's name with his own on his newly acquired prizes. The locomotive which performed the opening ceremony arrived in May 1942, and is seen here just prior to the actual event in July. This engine had enjoyed an eventful life. Built in 1906 for the tramway de Finisterre, it was delivered instead to Fro in whose fleet it was numbered 19 and given the name Patri. In 1914 it was captured by the Germans near the Belgian frontier and used by them throughout the First World War. Returned to its rightful owners in 1919, it was again taken over by the Germans in 1940. Altogether there were between 10 and 14 engines on the meter gauge line and all of either 040, 060, 260, or 080 wheel configuration and all tank engines. Most were returned to France at the end of 1943, except for the three which were photographed at the Weybridge in February 1946, just before they were broken up. On the right is a German 060 built by Orenstein and Koppel, which was in steam when the photograph was taken, having just brought the other two in from St. Oban. In the centre, is a 260 built in 1913 for the Chemin de Fer du rhône et loire This locomotive arrived in July 1942 and was taken by road to the then isolated St. John to St. Peter section, where it subsequently spent most of its time in Jersey. On the left is another Fro engine, built by Corpé et Louvé, and probably number two. And these views show all the engines in subsequent stages of demolition. The 60 centimeter line to the east had a motley collection of side tipping wagons, high sided trucks, and a few flat trucks. While to work the narrow gauge line, two brand new wood burning locomotives of Czechoslovakian manufacture were provided in 1943, but soon returned to France. And what little traffic remained after this time was handled by a somewhat decrepit French 040. After all the rolling stock had been returned to France, the track was pulled up by German troops who were by now prisoners of war. When this task had been completed by early 1946, it could be thought that all traces of railways had been removed from Jersey, but in fact many relics survive, not only of the German lines, but of Jersey's former railways as well. It is a matter for regret that this form of transport has vanished from the island forever. So we will finish with a last look at the OT Orenstein and Koppel, which has taken its place in local railway history as the last full-size steam locomotive ever to run in Jersey.